Gospel of St. John. The Gospel of St. John, and our reading will begin with verse 46 and continue through verse 54. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 4, excuse me, uh, beginning with verse 46. Amen? Amen. And it reads, So Jesus came into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea, saw him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down here, my child is dying. And Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then he inquired of them the hour when his son began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. This again, John says, is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. If you'll be seated, I just want to pose a question. Does God intervene? Does God intervene? Now, before I move forward, because I know a whole lot of folk want to mess with me, amen. Uh, he didn't intervene on my behalf on last night, amen. But, but God is not concerned about temporal affairs, amen. and including Christmas, that it would be very appropriate to, to, to just have some sermons on the miracles of our Lord. And the reason I thought it would be good to do some sermons on the miracle of our Lord, because one of the greatest miracles to have ever taken place uh, is literally what we are celebrating, amen, uh, the birth of the birth of our Christ. And so I thought the miracles of our Lord would be very appropriate to deal with uh, during this month. But the question posed is, does God intervene? My brothers and sisters, every thinking, every rational person, sooner or later reaches a point uh, or reaches a position where he or she must make some decision concerning the relationship which exists between the natural world in which we live and the supernatural world which lies above and which lies beyond. Every rational, every thinking person must make some sort of some decision as it relates to this, this physical world in which we live and the unknown spiritual world which we do not see. And the ultimate decision has to be, does that supernatural world exist? Does God exist? And does God intervene in our world? And that becomes very important from the standpoint of human application because all of us will reach points in our life where there will be no answers for our dilemmas in this physical world. We'll all reach cruxes and crossroads in life. We'll all reach points in life where there are no seeming remedies for what ails us in this world. And so we are rational thinking individuals, but we must come to a point where we are able to resolve within our mind, is there another world? Is there a God who can penetrate, who can do something about the things that are going on in our world? I submit to you today, if one does not believe in that which is supernatural, a God who is above and beyond, then we are of all people most to be without hope. Yes. Where, my brothers and sisters, do the supernatural and the natural meet, and how is it that they are related to one another? 
even in some Christian circles today, there seems to be a strong drift and a very frank, albeit responsible, recognition or no longer recognition of the supernatural. Now, please understand, in some circles, there is an overemphasis on the supernatural. But be it that there is an overemphasis on the supernatural does not permit us to digress from the fact that God does intervene. Yeah. I want you to understand something. Every time you pray, it is an acknowledgement that you believe that God intervenes. Yeah. Because prayer is an acknowledgement that there are some things in this world that you cannot work out on your own. So when you go to God in prayer, you are asking for supernatural intervention. Young people, you may be simply asking God to pray, to, to, to bless you to get through an examination or a test. But if you call out to God in prayer, you are asking God to do something that you cannot do. Grown folk, anytime you pray to God, you are going to God because you know it's something that you cannot fix. So you are literally asking God to intervene. So every reasonable person must come to some decision as it relates to God's ability to intervene in our world. Dr. John Davis, in the dictionary of the Bible, says that miracles are very prominent in four different phases of biblical history. Miracles are very prominent during the time of the redemption of God's people from Egypt as they are established as a nation under Moses and Joshua. And we'll find that Moses and Joshua were given the supernatural ability to perform signs and wonders in the midst of Pharaoh, not in order simply as we will see to bring amusement and amazement, but Moses, when God called him to go and deliver the children of Israel, he said, how will I be able to offer how would I be able to prove to Moses that I am your divine messenger? And God said, go, take this rod with you, and this rod will enable you to perform certain signs and miracles to authenticate that I, as God, will intervene in this world. You know the story, the children of Israel were in bondage, and God said, I will come down, and I will intervene. The Bible is a record of the fact that God does intervene on behalf of man. Secondly, the life and death struggle of the true faith and heathenism under the period of Elijah and Elisha. And you'll find that these two prophetic voices were able to perform miraculous signs and wonders in order to authenticate that he is the true God, the God who can rise above any pagan nation, the God who can bring everything to naught. But then we find a third period during the exile when Jehovah offered proof of his power and supremacy over the gods of the heathen. And so when Daniel and his three fans, friends stood steadfast and believed in God, you'll find that God performed miracles in a furnace and in a lion's den in order to prove and authenticate to the world that he is the one and only true God. And then fourthly, Dr. Davis says during the time of the introduction or the inauguration of Christianity during Jesus and the apostles. We find miraculous signs being performed. And they were done in conjunction with the accrediting of a new and divinely given message. My brothers and my sisters, there is and will always be a conflict between the supernaturalism of the Bible and the naturalism of man. That is our predicament even right now. There is a natural nature that is in man that does not want to believe there is something supernatural and something beyond us. That's what got man in the predicament that he is in today. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve wanted to go with their natural nature, defying the supernaturalism. But I want you to understand something today. It is by written revelation 
that God manifest his plans and designs respecting us. And so it is by necessity that God would have fortified the divine message by these miraculous authoritative proofs that we see in scripture. Modernism or even postmodernism offers us, my brothers and sisters, a non-miraculous Christianity. Be very careful watching CNN and the Discovery Channel leading up to Christmas. There will be a number of stories on the birth of Christ, on the Virgin Mary. But all of those stories, and they will even have some from the theological academies of this nation who will be on there talking about the birth of Christ, but will deny the supernatural aspects of his birth. I want you to understand something, my brothers and sisters, that we must be on guard, particularly during this holiday season and all of the hustle and bustling of shopping. The enemy is still on attack and he is using even some in Christian circles who have been given worldly accreditation to disprove the virgin birth of Christ. I want you to understand something. If it is just a natural birth, then he is just a natural man. And if he is just a natural man, then we are all people most to be pitied. And so every reasonable, thinking, and rational person must come to some decision whether God intervenes in this world. His birth was not a natural birth. Thus, he is not a natural man. And this is not a natural book. As postmodernism in the Enlightenment age would suggest, if our Christianity is a non-miraculous Christianity and the Enlightenment movement professes that no reasonable, sane, enlightened person can possibly believe that those miracles in the Bible are true, no reasonable, rational person who has been born and educated in the scientific age which says that things that cannot be observed or reproduced don't exist, no rational, reasonable person would believe that a man can die and get up from the grave, no sane person can believe that blind eyes can be open because technology has not been able to do it. So how can you be so primitive to believe that there is another world that can intervene in this world? You've got a decision. You've got a choice. You've got to make. But if if we are left with the postmodern thought. That Christianity is non-miraculous, where does that leave us? If we deny his miracles, if we deny his deity, if we deny his incarnation, if we deny his suffering, death, and resurrection, and his claim to be judged, where does that leave us? A miracle, my brothers and sisters, in the sense of a direct entrance of God in word and deed into human history for gracious ends is of the very essence of Christianity. And I want you to understand something, my brothers and sisters, as we move forward, that God intervenes and miracles were performed in the Bible, not simply for a means of amusement or astonishment, but God used them as a means for gracious ends. In other words, he always had redemptive purposes in mind. Yes. Theists, for those who believe in God, as opposed to atheists, those who do not believe in God. Theists, we believe in a personal, self-existent God who created and rules the universe. We have admitted uh, a belief in the great basic principle of the supernatural when we claim a belief in a personal, self-existent creator God. We have admitted the belief in a supernatural. Once the existence of a personal God is admitted, the possibility of the supernatural cannot be denied, my brothers and sisters. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, there are some things that eye has not seen, some things that ear has not heard. There are some things that can only be revealed by God. So Paul, when he says, there are some things that eye has not seen, he, he speaks to the empiricist and, and says that, that I acknowledge that there is a way of acquiring knowledge through the five senses. 
but there are some things that the five senses cannot give you. And then when he says there are some things that have not entered to the heart of man, he says there are some things that man can logically conjure up, that he can reason through on his own. And so he tells the rationalists, I'm not denying that there are some things that you can acquire based on human knowledge, but still human knowledge has limitations. There are some things that can only be revealed by God. But then man says, but if there are some things that can only be revealed by God, I've got a problem. Because I do not comprehend, therefore I do not believe. If I can't understand it, I'm not going to believe it. But I want you to understand something. To say, I do not comprehend, therefore I do not believe, is an unjust claim. Because it seeks to demand of God what God does not owe us. God does not owe us explanation for everything. There are some mysteries that he, by his divine nature, can relegate to himself. So I dare the arrogance of the natural man to say, if I can't comprehend, I will not believe. I dare you make such an unjust claim to an all-wise, omnipotent, and all-knowing God to demand something of God that God does not owe us. He does not owe us the explanation of mystery. God does what he wants to do. Are y'all going to pray with me here today? But it's also an unreasonable claim. God puts himself in communication with man is already a mystery. The mere fact that God would communicate with man is a mystery. The infinite communicating with the finite, we can't even understand that. How are we going to understand something even more deep? And the reason why it's also a mysterious claim is because the mysterious uh, multiplies with discovery. If God were to explain the mysteries to us, the revealing of the mysteries would multiply more discoveries with us. In other words, the increase of knowledge would bring an increase of ignorance. Have you not discovered the more we learn about God, the more we find out we don't know about God? That's why it is an unreasonable claim to say, God, if I don't comprehend, I won't understand. Because the more illumination God gives us, the less we actually understand about who God is. Because the one more we come to know more about God, the more we come to understand how infinite and how vast he is and how unknowledgeable we are about who God is. It's also a useless claim because we need to understand the Bible was written with one purpose and one purpose only and that is to reveal that God can redeem. What good does it know? What good is it to know what it is that God conceals from us? It is enough for us to know that this Bible is the word of God. We don't need to know all the details about how it came to be. It is enough for us to know that Jesus is the son of God. We don't need DNA to find out the divine human aspects of his nature. It is enough for us to know that unless you are born again, you will not enter the kingdom of God. We don't need to know all the explanations of how the Holy Spirit brings about that miraculous regeneration. We just need to know that if it don't take place, we can't get into the kingdom of God. And so as we look at the miracles of our Lord, particularly in John chapter 4, John says that Jesus came into Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. Now John often, John often identifies a place or a person as he does in verse 46 because he wants to note some circumstance which has made that area memorable. And so it harkens us back to his first miracle in John chapter 2 at the wedding which was a festive occasion where Jesus miraculously turned the water into wine. Now John wants us to know something here about the God who intervenes because he says in verse 46, that Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee. But when he comes again, he comes to a sorrowful situation. 
Now, what that tells us, my brothers and sisters, and what John wants us to know, is that in John chapter 2, Jesus appears in a joyful situation and makes the joy increase. In John chapter 4, Jesus shows up at a sorrowful situation and takes away the sorrow. And what that helps us to understand about a God who intervenes, it tells us that God will be with, in, with us in the good times and God will be with us in the bad times. He, he never, ever <laughs> leaves us alone. Now the Bible says that if he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine, it says there was a certain nobleman, a man of high status, a man of royalty in the government, whose son was sick at Capernaum. And then verse 47 opens up and said that when he heard that Jesus was back in that area, he left where he was and came to Cana. Now what had happened was news had circulated about Jesus turning water into wine. And so they said, here is a wonder worker. Here is a miracle worker. And so this nobleman, this royal man heard that Jesus was back in the same area where he had performed a miracle before. And he said when he heard that he was there, he said, I'm going to go and see if this Jesus can do something about my son. And when Jesus got to him, he said, I need you to come down to my house and heal my son because he is at the point of death. And then Jesus offers a rebuke with an implication of encouragement. He said, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, the term miracles in sacred scripture, my brothers and sisters, sometimes is referred to as wonders, signs, powers, and works. Jesus said, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. We'll find that miracles in the Bible referred, number one, to as a wonder. When we see the word wonder, it makes us think of the astonishment which the word produces on the beholders. We see in Mark chapter 2 and verse 12, when the man was laid down through the roof, that everybody, they, they considered it a wonder, and they were astonished. They were amused at what, what had taken place. When we see the word wonder, this word, my brothers and sisters, it, it transfers uh, the, the astonishment from the event to the actual work itself. This word, my brothers and sisters, wonder, barely touches the surface. The ethical meaning of the miracle would be lost were blank astonishment only the mere purpose for the miracle. God, through Jesus Christ, did not perform miracles or wonders simply for amusement or astonishment. He was not in the entertainment business. That word wonder barely scratches the surface. The word wonder means simply that amusement or astonishment was drawn in order to cast light on something else. A wonder was done in order to startle men from their sense-bound existence. A wonder. He would do these and people would say it was a wonder because God knew through Jesus that individuals in their natural state are bent or are confined to their sense-bound existence. They want to find all the answers in this world. They want to be able to touch it. They want to be able to comprehend it. They want to be able to figure it out on their own. But every now and then, God has to do a wonder to pull man from his sense-bound existence and acknowledge that there was a greater God who can intervene. And he startles us from our sense-bound existence with a wonder, not merely with the sense to astonish and amuse, but to open our eyes for a spiritual appeal. You see, the, the, the God of this world has blinded eyes, and that's why folk can't be saved. And so you'll find in the Bible that God will pull people from their sense-bound, darkened existence so that they can see the true light that has come into the world. But then miracles are also, my brothers and sisters, called a sign. A sign is a token or indication of the near presence and working of God. In this word, sign, we see the ethical purpose of the miracle coming out more prominently than in the word wonder. They, they are signs and pledges of something more and something beyond themselves. 
A sign does not draw attention to itself. A sign draws attention to something else. If you leave here, headed west on 44, you'll see signs that say Oklahoma City. The sign is not the event. The sign is pointing to what is 107 miles down the road. Are y'all going to play with me here today? And so a sign or a miracle in the Bible was a pledge or a token of something that was greater than the sign. It was pointing people who were living in this earthly world who had to a God who was beyond them. Valuable as they are, but not so much for what they are as for what they indicate about the grace and power of the doer. But then they're also called powers. Y'all don't mind if I take my time, do you? Powers. That word conjures up. It conjures up not so much the effect as the cause. Because when one uses the word power in reference to a miracle, one naturally thinks power from who? Power from what? And so the word power causes us to give a name to the effect of what has taken place. And so the question with the word power, with whom does the power dwell? And so it reminds us that the power dwells with God. John uses the word works, fourthly, as a word to refer to miracle. And John wants us to understand that Jesus must, out of the necessity of his higher being, put forth works that are greater than man's. He must put forth works that are greater than man's. Now, I want you to understand something, and y'all bear with me. you got to put your thinking caps on this morning. There's a supernatural world and there's a natural world. But God works in both. And so one must ask the question, how does the miracle differ from an event in the ordinary course of nature? How does the supernatural differ from the natural? Some would say that in the miracle God is working. But in other natural events or other natural occurrences like the sun rising and the sun setting, that God simply leaves things to operate under their own natural course. But I want you to understand something. That is not true. God is miraculously at work in the supernatural events and in the natural order of things. To say that God is not at work in both would imply that he constructs, that he creates, and that he leaves it alone or dismisses his hand. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 that he upholds all things by the word of his power. My brothers and sisters, the miracle is but a different manifestation of him, not a greater manifestation. What do I mean by that? In the natural working of things, we see the finger of God. In the supernatural working of things, we see the finger of God. When the finger of God works in the natural workings of things, when the finger of God makes the sun rise, when the finger of God makes the sun set, when the finger of God makes the wind blow, when the finger of God makes blood go through your body, when the finger of God allows you to keep breathing, that is the finger of God concealed. And the finger of God concealed simply reveals and acknowledges to the entire world that there is a God. But when we see the finger of God used in a more particular sense, particularly in the miracles of our Lord, these are the revealed finger of God, a different manifestation of the hand of God used to claim the attention of some specific person in order to expose them to the redemptive purposes of God. The finger of God is working in the natural order and the supernatural order. But when he works in the supernatural order, it is but a different manifestation when God says, I want you to know who I am so I can draw you to my son. I want you to know something else. A miracle is not against nature. A miracle is not unnatural. The healing of the sick can in no way be determined or turned against nature. It is sickness that is abnormal, not health. God created everything good. He created everything healthy. 
Before man fails, he can reach for a rose and not be pricked with a thorn. What is natural is what God created. What is unnatural is what we have turned it into. And so when God performs a miracle, he simply turns things back to what he taught him. He simply restores things to their primitive order. Are you with me? So you need to understand, my brothers and sisters, that it is sickness that is unnatural. It is everything that occurs in this natural fallen world that is unnatural. And so when God performs a miracle, he is simply restoring things back to that in the way in which he created it. Are you with me on that? And so we should not even see the resurrection of the body as something contrary to nature or unnatural. The petitioner, the nobleman in this text, was drawn to Jesus by an outward need, a need which no other but he, Jesus, could supply. And when he went to Jesus, Jesus gave him a rebuke, but also an encouragement and an answer. It was an implied promise to intervene. He said in verse 29, Sir, come down to my house. Jesus said, I've got to do a miracle. And I've got to do a miracle because this man is still at the elementary level of faith. Now, how do we know the man is at an elementary level of faith? That was the rebuke. Jesus said, if you have to see a sign or a wonder to believe in me, that is an elementary level of faith. So, so, so Jesus has to prolong the situation because this man's elementary level of faith was hooked into and even the surrounding crowd based on the miracle he did in, 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 in John chapter 2. They had linked Jesus' help to his bodily presence. That was the weakness of their faith. They, they had linked Jesus' ability to help with him being physically present. But you'll notice in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 8, there was a centurion who said, I don't need you to come to my house. Just speak the word. See, that, that was a, a higher level of faith. I, 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 I don't need to see no smoke. I don't need to see a cloud of dust. I don't need you to touch me on the head. I don't need a handkerchief. I don't need no oil. I don't need folk falling all over the place. I don't even need to see how my son get up. Is somebody going to pray with me here today? I'm messing with some of y'all today because y'all like to be amused, y'all like to be entertained, y'all want to see stuff. But this man had a high level of faith because I don't have to see how you do it. That's a mystery you can keep all to yourself. I just know if somebody gonna pray with me here today, I just know you can do it. But this man in this text, this nobleman, was still at an elementary level of faith and said, "Look," and even those around said, "If we see something, we'll believe you did it." Jesus said, wait a minute, this man's face needs strengthening. So what Jesus does was, he sends him away with a word of assurance. No magic tricks. He just sends him away with a word of assurance. Go your way, thy son lives. Now at this point, we have a double miracle. The body of the absent child, but also the heart of the present father. Yeah, yeah. A double miracle. Yeah, yeah. The, the body of the absent child raised, the curing of sickness, but also the heart of the present father. He's been cured of unbelief. Yeah. Mm. And so we begin to see that the miracle was not so much about the son as much as it was about the father. And as we move forward, we begin to see it is more about redemptive purposes than it is about physical healing. In verse 51, we'll see how it is that the man's faith grew. It says, and as he was going. That literally says, as he continued on his way. The word tense is imperfect. And it suggests that as the man went about his business. Now, what this suggests, my brothers and sisters, is that this man's confidence in Christ had grown to the point that he went on a leisurely 
his stroll home. Wait a minute. His boy is at home, dying. Jesus simply speaks the word, and this man don't run home. He went about his business. He went about his, he went to work, y'all. <laughs> he didn't go home and check on his son. When you read the text, it was a four, it was a four hour journey back home. The man didn't get home till the next day. If, if your child, child is sick, and the doctors say your child is gonna be well if you go home and give him this medicine, you're not gonna tarry going home. The Bible says, Jesus said, at my word, go home, your son liveth. This man went about his business. The next day when he was going home, folk ran out to meet him. Man, where you been? Your son is up. The man said, when did he get up? They said at about the seventh hour. He realized it was the same time that Jesus said, he said, what's wrong with y'all? I didn't have an encounter with Jesus, and I realized that Jesus did not have to be at my son's house. Also realized, I got so much trust and confidence in God that I can go about my business. I ain't got to worry. I ain't got to fret, because when I turn it over to him, he got it. And y'all going to pray with me here today. And so the man went about his business. But notice something else when he inquired. The Bible says at what time it took place, it says that the fever left him. That literally means the fever left him altogether. There was no turning point. It was not a slow process. We need to understand something about that miracle. It means that God does something instantaneously. And then we see the primary purpose in verse 53. He and his whole household believed. See, when God intervenes in the world, it is not merely because he need to understand that this temporal world is groaning to be redeemed. He gonna replace this thing. And so when God intervenes in this world, it is always with redemptive purposes primarily in mind. He's trying to get folks saved. And I want you to understand something. This text suggests some very important things to us. It does not matter who you may be. Sooner or later, like this nobleman, you are going to experience some great sorrows or even tragedies in your life. And I am not trying to spread gloom, but I'm trying to get you to thinking. How will you react to such events when they come? What will you do? Jesus said, believing is seeing. The world says, seeing is believing. Jesus said, one must believe first, then he will see the results. Folk came to Jesus and said, we want to see a sign, we want to see a wonder, we want to see first, then we'll believe. Jesus says, that might be the natural order of things, but that's not the supernatural order of things. The supernatural order of things, you got to convince me that you said that you believe it before you're going to see some results. And so what is the application to our experience? It helps us to understand that if Jesus acted as he did with this man, and his actions had this effect on this man, that we can be sure that Jesus is the answer to all the anxieties that we are dealing with in life. If Jesus dealt with the anxieties in this man's life, it lets us know that whatever is troubling us, that same God will intervene on whatever is going on in our life. But also the experience of this text teaches us and describes to be true even though the results may be postponed. God will work on your behalf. I know some of us have been waiting for a long time for God to do what he has spoken by his word. But the text by way of personal application helps us to understand that God if he gives the word, we don't know when it's going to come. And it's an unjust claim for us to say God tell me when it's going to come. That is a mystery that is relegated for God's knowledge. But we need to understand something. He may not come when you want him to come. But if you can if you can believe it, the results are on the way. Is somebody going to pray with me here today? But then also, we understand from this text that the truths from God's word are not only for the noble son, but the truths of God's word are for everyone. 
I don't know what you've been asking God to do in your life. I don't know what you need God to do in order to intervene on your behalf. But the text lets us know that when we come to God, the same God who intervened in miraculous ways for redemptive purposes in the Bible is still operating in the same way. I have not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. I want you to understand something, my brothers and sisters. Your pain may be great, but God is greater. Your tears may be flowing, but God can wipe the tears from your eyes. He is a God that will intervene on your behalf. And the greatest way that God intervenes, we are celebrating even right now. The Bible says that there was a God who was divinely born supernaturally in a woman by the name of Mary. And I want you to understand something. That was a supernatural event. And I don't care what science claims. I don't need to understand it. The Bible said it. I don't have to prove it. The Bible tells me so. And that's all I need to know. That God was born of a virgin by the name of Mary. He was born in a manger. I don't have to know the exact date. I don't need to know the midwife's name. I don't need no birth certificate. I don't need the time of arrival. But I do know he was born. I know he lived a sinless life. I know he died a vicarious death. He died on the cross for your sins and mine. Come and know him today. 